Good morning, everyone. Welcome to part two of our Real Estate Summit series focused on Miami legacy families. It's presented by our Chambers Real Estate Committee, led by Mark Ains and Carol Alice Cutler. I'm Alfred Sanchez. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Miami Chamber. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with you today. I want to give special thanks to our sponsors who are always generously supporting these events and bringing them to you. Coastal Construction, Douglas Elliman, the Graham Companies, Miami Association of Realtors, BDO, and the Allen Morris Company. So thank you all for making today possible and for participating. <clears throat> I'm excited uh, for today's program, which features residential and commercial market updates from our very own Teresa King Kenny and David Restainer. I know that uh, Teresa gives her update every year, and it's something that I think many of us look forward eagerly to. Uh, we'll have a few words from one of our legacy family, the Alan Morris Company, and Alan Morris has been a great friend of the chamber and this community. And it'll be followed by a panel discussion moderated by Anthony De Yuri uh, from Bilton Sumberg and our real estate legacy family panelists from the Goldwyn family, the Graham family, and the Cervera family. Uh, three incredible families uh, among many uh, that have literally built this community. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories of uh, how they were building their family business while they were also successfully building Miami's real estate community. Uh, before we turn it over to Carol, I want to just run through some of the logistics for today. Uh, your microphones are muted, but uh, we do want you to uh, interact and uh, intermingle using the chat look there at the chat box because we'll be dropping links uh, and information that you want to pay attention. If you want to share links, please feel free to do that. Networking is part of being part of the chamber. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to get back to in-person networking, but for now, let's, uh, let's network through the chat. Now, if you have a question for our panel, use the Q&A feature uh, because that's where our staff working hard behind the scenes are going to be looking for your questions. So again, please use the Q&A for your questions. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, uh, and we will make it available later on on our website, so go there to, to find it if you want to uh, catch up on anything you may have missed or uh, share it with some of your colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce to you the Vice Chair of the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce Real Estate Committee, Carol Ellis Cutler, to begin our program. Carol, thank you for all you do and for uh, really kicking off this program, so I'm going to leave it over to you. Thanks again. Thank you, Alfred, and welcome everyone. We're very excited to be here today. And, and again, thank you to our sponsors, as well as the staff of the chamber. Myself as vice chair and Mark Ames as the chair of the Real Estate Committee are so pleased to be able to work with quality staff members, Alfred, that you tutored and uh, Christina and Tanya, thank you so very much for your help in all that you do. Um, Legacy Family Program, we're very excited to have the premier families being able to speak to us today. And it's dear to my heart, uh, being a cutler that owned property on Brickell Avenue and being in the commercial real estate for 25 plus years, uh, we are gonna have an exciting program and uh, I'm sure you all enjoy. Uh, it's my honor to serve um, as your vice chair. We have our goals conference coming up. So besides today, stay active with our Greater Miami Chamber if you're not a member, we encourage you to reach out to any of us to become more active. And from all of us at CBRE, we are pleased to see the report come to the community from two of our leaders here today. And, and I know at our annual programs in real estate, we have always enjoyed this report that we'll hear first. And at this time, it is my honor to introduce to you for the first program on the residential forecast. And, Miami has hotter than ever, uh, so we're excited to have, at this time, we're going to invite our presenter, Teresa King Kinney, to present to us and uh, take notes. There's wonderful slides, and, and this information will be available to you afterwards. And again, questions, please submit to the chat. At this time, I'm introducing Teresa. Welcome. Thank you so much, Carol, and hello, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you again to talk to you about the hottest market in the nation, possibly the world. 
So what I'm gonna do is share my screen and this presentation will be available afternoon today so that any of you will be able to, um, to view it and to use it at, uh, at your convenience. All right, so Miami Association of Realtors is 101 years old and we have been proudly serving this community. We are the largest local realtor association in the entire nation, second largest in the world, and we now represent 54,000 members. And so what we wanna do now is go ahead and take a look at the Miami market update for 2021. Miami-Dade closed sales for April. I have to tell you, April was the highest April in the history of Miami Realtors and the MLS. So all property types, sales are actually up 151%. Single families up 83%, but look at this, condos and townhomes up 234%. I have to tell you, the last two or three months is the first time in a long time that condos have outpaced single family, especially with everything that was going on during the pandemic where the move was definitely to single family homes. Now look at this, condos are back big time. Let's talk about luxury sales because the news is great. Rising for the 10th consecutive month, but look at these numbers. Over a million dollar properties up 541%. Wow, that's amazing. Let's look at the, the mid-market sales, which are up also. Mid-market, we consider $400,000 to $600,000. For single family, it's up 119%. For condos, wow, 371% increase. So what's behind the surge in housing? Well, a lot. Uh, U.S. individuals and companies moving from high-tax, high-density areas to South Florida. No surprise, you're hearing a lot about that low mortgage interest rates, pent up demand, all of those things are making a huge difference for us. And of course the sunshine and Miami being Miami doesn't hurt at all. So let's talk about pending sales because that's an indication of what's going to happen with the market. The green line that you see here are the pended sales and the blue bars are the closed sales. So in April, pending sales are up 229%. Single family up 103, but look at condos and townhomes. What an amazing increase that is. So now let's look at dollar volume of all property types for April. Look at how that chart is going up. I love that. So for Miami-Dade County, the sales are $3.4 billion in the month of April. Month supply, way down during the, this last few months. We are down to 4.8 months average. But look at that, single family is down to 2.2 months. And condos and townhomes at 7.1 months, that's what we consider a balanced market while single family is in a seller's market. And so here's a chart on months of supply by price point. And I'll have that available in the presentation so you'll be able to study that more. I don't have time in my 12 minutes to include more update on that. So our median sale prices, remember that all of that high-end luxury um, increase in sales that we have has an impact on the median sale price. But right now, single family median sale price is 515,000 with median price for condos and townhomes at 325,000. So let's look at who across the United States is looking at our market. So we have the top 10 there, according to Realtor.com, but actually what it boils down to is Atlanta, LA, and Metro New York with a bullet. Uh, Seattle is also in there, but those are the top markets that we have looking at Miami. So let's look at international. Miami has been and still is number one in the entire United States for international traffic. So people from all over the world who are searching realtor.com for properties in the United States search in Miami as number one. So 2021 market projections. Well, real estate is the bright spot. We are propping up the economy. High demand, low inventory, and low interest rates and prices will continue to increase. Very strong demand, low supply, and we have had strong and fast recovery while many other industries have struggled during the pandemic. 
Miami is the new home of tech and finance, and all you have to do is open the newspaper every week, sometimes every day. There are new announcements about the companies that are coming here, including today. I also like that Miami Luxury Real Estate forecast price growth. We are tied for number four in the entire world, according to the prestigious Knight Frank 2021 Wealth Report. Lots of other reasons people are coming here. Now, many of you know that the Miami Realtors commissions a study by the National Association of Realtors every year for international home buying. What we did this year, this last study, was to ask them first to ask about out-of-state buyers because that's the huge story for Miami. International is still good, but the huge story are the out-of-state buyers. So look at this, New York with a bullet, 28%. Um, of buyers coming from New York. California, New Jersey, okay, and we consider New York, New Jersey, so that would actually put that at 38%. California and New Jersey tied for 10%, and then you can see the other markets that are moving here. So nationally on the study, the international sales decreased um, over the last three years, but still strong. In Florida, they decreased, not as much as nationally, and again, still strong. So what about Florida? Of the major US destinations for Florida buyer, for, for foreign buyers, I just can't get Florida out of my mind. Florida has been number one for the past 12 years. And if you look at that chart, if you can see it, 22% of all sales internationally that come into the United States are in Florida. That's more than one in five of every international buyer buys here in our state. But the next chart is my favorite. Nearly half of all of Florida's foreign buyers buy here in our Miami region. And so we're at 47.3% of all foreign buyers buy in our region. Number two is Tampa, way down at 11. Number three is Orlando, and they're under 10%. So. Nobody competes with us when it comes to foreign buyers. So in our region, 70% of the foreign buyers buy here in Miami-Dade County. So we are the absolute capital still for foreign investment. So even though the dollar volume also decreased here, it's still really strong. Let's look at the, the share. The, it's 32% of all of our dollar volume. That's a lot. When you compare that to, oh, and 23% of all properties sold. So let's compare that to state and national. So we're at 23% of all sales. Florida is at 8% of all sales. Now remember, Florida is the number one site for foreign sales, and that's at only 8%. And then nationally, it's 3%. So who's buying here internationally? Well, our top tier countries of origin are, I'll read them off very quickly for you, starting with number one, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, Spain, France, Italy, and Chile. Those aren't the only ones buying here. So your favorite country may have been in the top markets, it may be here, but you'll see that we have the most diverse buyers of any of the markets anywhere. Most of the buyers, most of the states are limited to the top three international buyers, not us. So here's the part that goes really fast and it's the top 20 or so rankings for 2020 and 2021. What is it that people are saying about us? Where are we ranked? Are you ready? Go. Mm -hmm. Miami is ranked the most glamorous city in the entire United States. Miami-Dade County ranked number one for most Flor former Californians getting Florida driver's licenses. Those numbers are gonna to continue to increase. Miami is ranked number one for the best city for foodies in America. Wynwood, number 26, coolest neighborhood in the entire world. Okay, we have to include this. Miami ranked the sexiest city or second sexiest city in the world, depending on which one of those reports you want to go by. This is new. Miami is the naked gardening capital of America, really. Also, for those of you who'd like to note on your calendar, May 1 is actually Naked Gardening Day, just a bonus there. 
Um, I please forgive me for including this. When I saw it come through for the first time, I just had to include horniest cities. Number three is Hollywood. Really? Who knew? What's going on in Hollywood? Number six, Fort Lauderdale. And it's really okay that Miami is 48 on this one. Next, South Florida is number four for top U.S. relocation destination for Americans who moved during COVID. Miami ranked number two, best U.S. city for small business in 2020. South Florida ranked number one among U.S. metros with largest migration changes for software and IT workers. Miami Beach ranked number one best market for home buyers, according to Realtor.com. Miami ranks number one in the U.S. with the most racially and ethnically diverse tech industry. The Miami-Fort Lauderdale area is number eight in the U.S. for dollar value of deals of all of 2020, beating out Austin and Washington, D.C. Miami is ranked among the top 40 most sustainable U.S. cities. Miami Commercial Real Estate ranked among the top 20 best places to invest in 2021. And look at this, Miami Lakes is ranked number 13 in the U.S. for the best work from home cities. Miami-Dade County, number eight among Movie Maker Magazine's best places to live and work. And South Florida is the most popular destination for New York transplants changing to Florida driver's licenses. Miami ranked number nine for best place to retire. We rank as the fifth most walkable city in the United States. We are the number six in the U.S. for the most newer homes for sale. That one surprised me. Fort Lauderdale ranks number four for best cities with LGBTQ home buyers. Miami ranked number two among top global cities to buy a luxury home in 2020, again, according to the Knight Frank Report. It's been my pleasure to present this quick update for you. All of these by 12 o'clock noon today will be posted on miamire.com slash market, market for you to enjoy. Thanks so much for allowing me to be here today and I'm gonna turn the program back over now. Thank you, Teresa. Wow, was that wonderful. If we were all in the room together this year, we would be standing and giving you another ovation. Wonderful, Teresa. And what a wonderful report on Miami and a great shout out to Miami Lakes. We are very, very fortunate to have such a great city. If you talk about it too much, we're gonna have that many more people move here, but we're pleased about all the reporting. So Teresa, thank you for sharing this. I'm also going to uh, turn on my lights here. Sorry guys, <laughs> this is live. And uh, at this time, we're gonna now switch from the overview from the residential market into the commercial real estate market. And one of our fellow vice chairs in the real estate committee and a very active member, we, we thank you for being continuing support of your, our committee. So at this time for a commercial real estate overview, I'm going to welcome to the program, David Restander. David, you are hey, on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. I am thrilled to be one of those realtors uh, and working under the leadership of Teresa Kinkenny. And, and as Alfred mentioned earlier today, it's definitely one of my very favorite parts of the presentation in the Real Estate Summit. Uh, my name is David Restainer. I'm the Managing Director of Commercial Real Estate for Douglas Elliman, Florida. Um, Douglas Elliman is also a sponsor. Uh, since 1911, Douglas Elliman has been in the real estate business and uh, Douglas Elliman's backed by a century's worth of insights and expertise, and uh, we're passionate about delivering unparalleled experiences from sales, rentals, and new development, mortgages, and title insurance. Our agents are relentless advocates for the clients, and um, our team's tops in the industry. They have the access to the best, most reliable information, education, which allows them to expertly advise their clients. And so um, I thank you, thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for giving this opportunity uh, to speak at the Real Estate Summit. This is my very favorite committee uh, um, until I take over as the New World Center Committee Chairman at the end of this month. Um, I am going to share my screen here. And um, and this, I cannot, this is a fantastic look at the data. It's really compelling. And I think we know the story of why we all love Miami. And I don't believe that we can really talk about 
commercial real estate, uh, we, we can't talk about commercial real estate much without talking about, which is really quite important, um, population. So uh, I'd like to do that right now. And here's a little something that you may have seen you may have seen before, and I hope that you can all see it now. It's a data analytics bar. So give me a thumbs up. All right, so what's happening here is that Miami was founded in 1896, and you're, I'll be talking as this little infographic runs like um, our class. It's really important in commercial real estate is moving fast. And uh, they don't follow the top. It's been moving Miami for quite some time. And you see that New York is a big, the big dog here. Uh, for a very, very long period of time, uh, from the 20s, and you're going to see very fascinating happen uh, shortly. Um, so, what the, when population moves, cities begin to grow, and Miami is very much reliant on a trans, on transfer of a migration of people coming to our city. And so, uh, many people also point out to the past months, well, and the dramatic population. We also have the benefit of the benefit of the um, And this, uh, everything was going swimmingly and fantastic throughout the, the course of time. <laughs> ah, and I'm um, sorry, my producer just uh, whispered in my ear. The so uh, our population was moving at a very steady pace. As Teresa mentioned, the luxury home sales and, and um, all of the residential real estate was steadily improving, steadily improving. And then wham, uh, there was a, a, a pandemic, which put the brakes on a lot of the commercial real estate business and had many of us uh, very uncertain about what was happening. But it turned out to be uh, uh, good news for us in a lot of ways in that Miami became more and more attractive for folks that were leaving other populations and moving to Miami internationally and domestically. Um, you'll notice now on our, our population chart that's declining without music, that Florida has now surpassed New York in 2014. Florida has become much, 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 much larger place and destination to be. And um, one thing that, uh, that I can tell you, I, a spoiler alert, it pretty much stays this way. California, Texas, Florida, all the way through 2050. Um, so uh, this population influx has, has been a main catalyst for commercial real estate, of course, right? And pandemic did have a, a, a certainly had an impact on that. And I want to make sure that, So anyway, the, the, so what did we learn in the pandemic and how did that relate to the commercial real estate update? I'll show you data a little bit later, but um, when we had the initial lockdown, there was 15 days to, to, to flatten the curve, you recall. And if you were to look at a Florida curve, you'd notice that it was rather flat. There were a couple of bumps along the way. And for the most part, the hospitality industry was uh, hurt pretty badly. We saw an extraordinary impact, um, similar to Zika, but it lasted much longer. Uh, many of us thought uh, that hospitality would not come back, that we'd be in grave trouble for quite some time. Many investors who kept the dry powder, they kept money on the sidelines, waiting for opportunities, waiting for decreases in prices, did not uh, achieve that. No, we didn't see any hotels that traded uh, less than 20% off their ask price, and very, very few of those were in trouble. Um, throughout the pandemic, I did have, spend a lot of time with my three-year-old son who, uh, in addition to being the love of my life, is also the mayor of Rourkeville. Conrad Rourke is the mayor of Rourkeville and on his tablet he plays a game called SimCity. And hopefully many of you in, in on this uh, uh, um, program have played SimCity and understand how it works. You basically build a city, you are the mayor and you need to add inputs to make your citizens happy. Uh, you parks, walkability, uh, uh, culture, education, all of these things are important to be a good mayor. And um, you get comments from people who support you. And as you can see in the right-hand side of, of the screen, you can design your city in any way that you'd like. You could also have contests among mayors in this video game, this kid's game 
and uh, mayors compete for citizens and the mayors design their cities so that they are attractive to others and they hope to attract people from other communities. So I think the commercial update uh, has to include this massive influx of tech and uh, financial services and the, the new economy uh, that is really uh, rounding out a very solid base of employment in Miami. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely not just a beach party town, although that's attractive to many, um, may, and maybe even Hollywood might be more attractive to some, but the uh, very large companies have chosen Miami to locate a, a tremendous, uh, I, I think a seismic announcement was when Blackstone relocate, relocated 200 of their innovation and tech employees uh, downtown and then um, consequently bought the building, uh, tremendous leases. And now we've got, you see a list here of some of these uh, companies who have moved here. It's no joke. Um, I'm skeptical by nature and, uh, and I think a lot of people are, and we might've been ex uh, skeptical on the first, second, maybe third, fifth announcement, but now when the jobs are entering the thousands and cryptocurrency companies are relocating and our American Airlines arena has been renamed. We're starting to really, I mean, if you don't believe it now, then I don't know if you ever will. Uh, the New World Center Committee did a tech uh, seminar. On that tech seminar um, was the head of SoftBank's Vision Fund and explained that hype is a good thing and it's great to be excited and hype is a fantastic thing if you take, if you seize that moment and you take advantage of it to tell your story. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's invested their time for this program today because you're telling the story too. It's just not uh, Mayor Suarez and Twitter. There's plenty of mayors, county mayors, city mayors, mayors of Rourkeville, and all of you as, as advocates for our city. And when these new folks are coming in here to start businesses, it's incumbent upon us to tell the Miami story and to help out. So here is some of the market update by uh, asset class. And um, see these are deliveries of new construction. Uh, and we'll go into great detail on it, but I can tell you that the story is not so bad, uh, even in retail as uh, retail uh, has probably been the hardest hit. Hospitality has been very badly hit. Uh, office, we see some backfill and that backfill comes mostly from all these new people coming to town. And um, Douglas Solomon Commercial, uh, had an opportunity to market a big property on the waterfront that we that was built out as a restaurant. We thought for certain in the beginning of the pandemic that would be an office. It had to be an office. Who would go to a restaurant? Who would want to open a restaurant in the middle of a pandemic? Well, about two or three months in, by the by fall of last year, we had nearly every restaurant group from New York, from New Jersey. We had California restaurants. All of these folks were coming in and looking because. Miami was now the place that you could operate freely uh, as a business owner. So the business friendly aspect of, of what our community offers is extremely attractive to, uh, to businesses of all types, of all asset classes. You notice that industrial is growing still. Um, developers can't build enough uh, warehouse and industrial space. Um, we can look at um, office and as far as the construction is, is concerned, we're, we're delivering new office spaces and, and prestigious leases are being signed, uh, especially in the 830, uh, 830 Brickle property is a 60 story uh, high rise class A building um, from OKO. And uh, the top two penthouses have been leased out to Thomas Bravo, which is a big fund from Chicago, which is relocating here. Um, hospitality numbers are, are not great. You know, historically Miami occupancies are very, very high. Some of the, usually in the top three in the nation you know, we compete with New York and, and Hawaii, you know, and Honolulu for occupancy. And, uh, and uh, so at 48% on the over the year, over one year, uh, it's, it's low for us historically, but it's much higher than it is in the rest of the United States of America. Um, last month, that number was more like 73% occupancy for Miami hotels, which is rather extraordinary. The nation is still struggling at about 53% occupancy. Our uh, ADRs are high compared to the rest of the United States of America. We're, we're doing okay. And most hoteliers were rescued by the various programs offered by our federal government, the, the payment protect, uh, paycheck programs um, and idle loans and things of that nature. 
which by the way, is another great plug for the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, who within a few weeks uh, launched into uh, a program where they became experts, the staff became experts in helping businesses navigate through PPP and IDLE and to keep these businesses afloat and to keep their employees employed. And I think that uh, the <clears throat> great work by Alfred and company uh, has, has been very, very impactful. So uh, the commercial update is, uh, uh, is mostly great and at least good and not nearly as bad as everyone thought. If you look at this chart, uh, we remember Friday, March 13th is the day that most businesses shut down and sent all workers home. At least that was what Douglas Elliman <laughs> did with 1,200 people in 24 offices. Uh, we all went home and tried to make sense of what was happening in this crazy new world. Um, and the, the, the aforementioned programs offered by the government help our businesses stay afloat, keep people employed and keep them active. So things started to recover. And by fall, uh, it looks like, you know, things were back, the economy was back to st stable when at first we had no idea what was happening, I think, frankly. Um, so what could go wrong? Well, uh, as we speak now, you can see that uh, the far right side of your graph, uh, inflation is starting to take hold. We're starting to see that construction costs are skyrocketing and, and uh, we're running into a little, we may run into some um, rough water ahead on that issue. Um, the, but the great overall news is that I think that our vaccination rates are high, people are healthy, we're st stabilizing very much with something that was an extraordinarily shock, an extraordinary shock to our system. And, and uh, I think we all banded together and, and we made it through. So um, I wanna thank you very much. Thanks to the sponsors for Coastal and, and BDO, uh, Graham Companies and, and Miami Realtors, of course. I'm really looking forward to the rest of this program. It's gonna be fantastic. So thank you all very much. <clears throat> Thank you, David. That was uh, enlightening and uh, some more great news. Now, um, I have the honor of introducing Alan Moores. Uh, with 82 successful and many award-winning commercial and mixed-use projects, $8 billion in business volume, a commercial real estate leader since 1958, the Alan Moores Company is one of the largest diversified real estate firms in the Southeast. They are known for their mixed use office, multifamily and multiple commercial projects. Plus they have a property management firm. So Alan Morris and the Morris family are undoubtedly one of the well-known if not best known or one of the best known legacy families here in Miami. And I'm happy and honored to introduce Mr. Alan Morris. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you today. Are you able to hear me all right? Yes. Uh, wonderful. Well, we are in full swing at the Alan Morris Company these days, and um, I'd love to have my son and my daughter uh, join me for this today, but they are very busy in uh, launching our uh, new developments right now. We have a big uh, statewide development meeting going on right now in our offices. And, um, and acquiring new hotels, which we're also actively doing. Um, but <clears throat> the thing that has made our family a legacy family, I think more than anything else, is our mission. And um, several years ago, I guess uh, 10 years ago, I, got, uh, I felt like it was time to figure out what did I really want? And you know, that may sound like a very silly question, but I find that most people struggle with knowing what it is they really want. And I was struggling with that. And uh, in that struggle came a clarity in terms of what I wanted for my own life and what I wanted turned out to be the mission for the Alan Morris Company. And that is the Alan Morris Company, really our mission statement is three words. Uh, we want to inspire, inspire people with the beauty of our projects, impress, we want to impress them with the excellence of their experience. And thirdly, we want to improve the lives of everyone we touch. And that's my personal life mission. And I realized that was what I wanted for the mission of the Alan Morris Company. And so as we clarified that, 
it became an attractive mission for our company, for my uh, son and my daughters who've worked in the company and for our extended family who are involved in the company and our extended family that want to invest together with us in all of our new projects. And um, what a legacy family is, you know, when I ask what is a legacy family, I have to say that a legacy family, real estate family is the life-giving infusion of energy and new ideas from the next generation. For years, we were a company that built net leased office buildings. When I took over from my father, I started building multi-tenant office buildings and, um, and made them more interesting, more impressive, more tenant oriented. And uh, one of those was the Alhambra Towers that we developed 21 years ago now. And uh, that building uh, is in Carl Gables and has won 10 awards. Uh, and that, in that building, the Alhambra Towers, we've had the, the privilege of, of uh, being a market leader, but it was a big risk. Um, so what is a legacy real estate family? It's where the life-giving infusion of energy and new ideas comes from the next generation. And how does that happen? I think it happens with clarity around your business mission and your personal mission. And that connected, that mission connected our family business and our, and our team members in the company uh, was something that everyone could embrace. And the result of that is the next generation of award-winning office buildings, multifamily apartments, condominiums, hotels. Um, and now we're also building and buying hotels. Uh, we've just purchased a hotel in New Orleans. We are purchasing a hotel this month in Miami Beach and buying hotels in Savannah and uh, developing hotels in Orlando and Atlanta with a hotel under construction in Atlanta right now. So we're very bullish on the future of the hotel business in certain markets and certain types of hotels. And uh, where do we do this? And where is our family involved in this now? Well, they've, uh, they've encouraged our expansion, not just in Miami and Coral Gables and Miami Beach, but also Orlando and Atlanta and New Orleans and Savannah and, uh, and uh, what's next? Well. My son, Spencer Morris, uh, who is leading our development meeting right now on a different Zoom call, um, is now our executive vice president and chief investment officer who leads all of our development activities. And my daughter is our brand manager for our hospitality company, um, developing and acquiring new hotels around the country. Uh, as of last month, we've completed our 85th development project and have a billion, 800 million in new development projects in our immediate pipeline. Um, so we, we want to keep inspiring, keep impressing and keep improving the lives of all that we touch. And uh, that's what gets my motor running and gets all of our, uh, all of our motors running at the Alan Morris Company uh, to do that. And the building you may know us more, um, <clears throat> more prominently for in, in Miami and in Carl Gables, uh, Alhambra Towers, um, which we have won 10 awards for that building. And it's undergoing a beautiful renovation and upgrades right now. And um, it looks like we may have a full floor available uh, for one of the new tenants coming from New York or California, because we're seeing people from New York and California uh, moving into our, into our buildings in Atlanta and our apartments in Atlanta and our apartments in Orlando and then our office uh, offices in Miami. So uh, Miami continues to be uh, a, the real shining star uh, for our company as we see people uh, calling frequently and asking, how can, we, how can we move our businesses? How can we move our families to, um, to South Florida? So I'm delighted to be here with you all and Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much, Alan. 
uh, really a delight to hear from you and to see you. And uh, we're all excited about uh, your prospects, your family's pro prospects, and continuing the legacy uh, that is the Morris family and the Alvin Morris company. So good luck to you, sir. And we're all looking forward to what comes down the pike in the future from you guys. Thank you. We love Miami. <laughs> <laughs> that said, uh, uh, as a chairman of the real estate committee for uh, Miami Beach uh, Chamber of Commerce, my, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, sorry, uh, I also have the honor of uh, being a sponsor. Coastal has the honor of being a sponsor, and I just want to make some remarks about Coastal. So, Coastal Construction and the Murphy family have been building throughout Florida for five generations for, for over 50 years. Uh, we've built over 60 hotels and resorts in excess of 7,000 keys. We've also built more than 12,000 residential units, and that's including apartment complexes, ultra luxury condos, student housing, uh, and rental. Uh, with over 400 team members, you know, Coastal's pre-construction and construction and post-construction pros are just unmatched in expertise, and we're consistently delivering solutions to the most complex project challenges here in Florida and obviously in Miami. We're currently building, or we've built, some of the most premier projects in Florida, including things you're driving by on a daily basis, like the plaza at Coral Gables, Porsche Design Tower, Fendi Chateau, Four Seasons at the Surf Club, Four Seasons Hotel and Private Residence in Fort Lauderdale, the Faena House and Faena Hotel, SLS Hotel, Mr. C, Coconut Grove, Ed the addition by Marriott, the St. Regis Bell Harbor, Armani Casa, Paramount Miami World Center, Luma at Miami World Center, Kyoba at Miami World Center. We've also built that uh, those beautiful two shopping plazas that anchor the Miami Design District. We're building currently Next Las Olas in Fort Lauderdale, the Cove Hotel in Orlando, which is just outside Disney. We're also working on multiple towers with the company known as Strategic Property Partners in Tampa. It's about 9 million square feet. It's about $5 billion of a mixed use. The mega, it's called the Mega Water Street Redevelopment Project. We just completed a JW Marriott there and there's a, a, a multiple of, prod, of towers continuing to go up as we speak. We're proud of our diverse construction portfolio in many market sectors, which includes projects from complex towers to intricate renovations. We've done, a, we do adaptive reuse. Our clients trust us to ensure that their development money is just not waiting for its return because of lagging construction schedules. And our local expertise really is unmatched uh, when it comes to our knowledge. Um, those have all kind of brought to bear and have resulted in some of the most uh, amazing, recognizable and iconic properties here in Florida. And uh, we're excited for the future. I know the Murphy family is, a, is uh, can be considered one of the, the premier legacy families here in Miami as well. Um, so uh, at this point, I wanna turn it over to Lydia, Stefania to give us uh, the, uh, the intro to our wonderful esteemed group of panelists. I'm sorry, Stefanova, I, I always do that, the two of you. I will try and not hold it against you. Hi, <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Lydia Stefanova. I am a CPA by day and I specialize in providing uh, auditing and accounting services to real estate companies like the many great companies that are in attendance uh, today. With that, it is my greatest pleasure today to introduce the panel, which is the reason why all of us are here today. And it's a great panel, a friendly discussion of some of the greatest families that have shaped Miami's real estate uh, landscape. Uh, the panel will be moderated by a friend, Anthony De Jure, who is an attorney with Bills and Sandberg, uh, he specializing in land development and government relations. And he, is, uh, he will be uh, having a discussion with uh, Jessica Goldman Srebnik, who is the CEO of Goldman Properties, 
and also the CEO and founder of Goldman Global Arts. If you were listening to the presentation that Teresa Kinkini just did, she gave a shout out to Winwood as one of the coolest neighborhoods in the world. I don't remember the ranking. I think she said number 26. I would say it's probably top 10 for me, but I'm biased as uh, somebody who uh, calls Miami a chosen home. Um, Goldman Properties is known for transforming neighborhoods all over the US, Miami Beach, Soho, and Wynwood, and many others. I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Um, also with us today is the Graham family, and representing the Graham family is uh, Stuart Wiley and Philip Wiley. Um, the Graham family has really shaped Miami Lakes. And again, going back to what uh, Teresa was saying, Miami Lakes was named the best place to live and work. How cool is that? Great job, Graham families. And then the last family that will be joining the panel today is the Cervera family. It is uh, one of the premier marketing and sales real estate companies who specializes in uh, sales of luxury uh, buildings here in Miami. And we will be joined by Alicia Cervera Senior, and then her daughter and her granddaughter, Veronica and Alexandra. Uh, without further ado, I uh, give you Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our, our panel discussion. Um, we are very, very lucky to have with us some of the folks um, that Miami would not be the place that's known for today. Some names like Goldman, Graham, and Cervera, without which the story of Miami would be completely different. It was uh, very much a pleasure to prepare for this panel and having conversations with them to really get to know a little bit about the story, not just in the uh, boardroom, but also in the uh, dining room and how blurry those two lines uh, uh, can get. I think one of the best ones I remember was, if you call me at 10 o'clock to ask me about the grandkids, I'm gonna take the phone call. If, but if you're calling me at 10 o'clock to ask me about that tenant, I might not pick up the phone. So uh, it, it really gives you a, a great perspective on what it is to not only be a, a real estate titan in, in this industry, but at the end of the day, have it all be wound up <clears throat> within sometimes the even more complicated dynamics of uh, our individual families. Again, my name is Anthony De Urre. I'm a partner at Bills and Sumberg. Uh, I specialize in land use and zoning. And when people ask me what that is, in particular, my mother-in-law, who still doesn't understand it, I just say, look, developers, I represent them. And they say, what can I build? How fast can I build it? And how do I navigate the approval process uh, to get it done? And then just because it was Alan speaking, I do have to say, uh, uh, I have his book here. This is his 50th anniversary book from when the company turned 50 years old back in 2008. And a lot of people don't know this, but uh, they developed uh, Dade Lane Mall, which is right there. And it was originally called The Road to Nowhere. I'm pretty sure nobody would call Dade Lane Mall the road to nowhere today. And, but it takes, again, another example of a visionary that's required to make uh, Miami what it is today. Um, look, each of each of these families, the Graham families, Cerveras and the Goldmans have had their own unique paths to get here um, and, and to get to the next generation. And I wanna start off with the concept that kind of just evolved organically in one of the conversations, which is there's a pool in front of you and the pool is the real estate business. Are you getting pushed in? Are you getting pulled in? Did you jump in head first? And when you got there, was it the shallow end or the deep end? Um, Jessica, because you're on my top left, I, f I literally feel like uh, um, the game show host right now with uh, uh, maybe the price is right or, or the, the, the squares. So Jessica, I'm gonna go with you in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, tell me about, did you get pushed or pulled and did you jump in head first into the pool? Um, well, thank you very much for having me to, to begin with. And um, 
you know, speaking about family legacy is really one of my favorite, favorite topics to talk about because it's something I'm really deeply passionate about. Um, but to answer your question, um, I chose to get into the pool. Uh, there were definitely times where I felt like I was pushed into the deep end and I had big cinder blocks on, you know, wrapped around my feet and I had to swim real hard to kind of keep my head above water. But I definitely chose to get in that pool after after sitting on the sidelines of, you know, watching what was happening in the pool for many, many years. And um, and I've been in that pool for over 24 years now and, and really happy to be there. Uh, now I remember the name of the, the, the game show. It's Hollywood Squares. Right. So, uh, so, so we have one for Jessica jumping in the pool uh, and there's Severa family. I have what I see are three generations. Uh, Jessica's, uh, to be correct, is the, is the second generation. Uh, the Severa family we have in front of us in one uh, screenshot, three generations. And uh, Stu and Philip. We're talking about now four generations uh, at the Graham Company. But since we have three in one room with the Cervera family, I'm going to go with them a second. And, I, and now that, that, you know, Alicia Sr., who is, uh, I think in my description here of her bio, I have to get it out there. Um, uh, Alicia Sr., you are described as the, um, let's see here, the queen of Brickle. And so I would imagine that you're also the queen of the family, but um, I want to hear maybe you without uh, interruption and they're in front of so many people, the truth where, where the different generations of the Severas pushed, pulled in the pool. Tell us how that evolved. It's your turn, Mark. Well, I am much more a person, a sick person than a poor person. And I will tell you that when I went to the sea, one of the things that I always tell my daughter and my granddaughter is to, they have to watch the waves, how the waves are moving. If, and you have to learn when you go under the wave or you go up the wave and you jump. And in Miami, you know, if you know this, in the real estate in Miami, it's always in a wave mode, it's like that. <laughs> and uh, I enjoy very much participating in this growing of the city. I arrived here in 1961. I am 91 years old, so I have been through a lot of, of changes, and uh, and that's part of the, the story. Okay. So I, I I will tell you that uh, mother's idea of business, I think, always started with having her her daughters because at that time my brother was very young, her daughters involved in her life. So in the 1960s, when she had this idea that Miami would go vertical. She would walk around with my uh, sister and I and look at all this, and she says, I've got to figure out some way that your father and I can get involved and buy one of these pieces of land. And so um, she, I don't would say she didn't push, but she just kind of wrapped us around this business, and it started out of necessity. You know, mother needed to do things like open houses, and she wasn't going to do them by herself, so we would go with her. And that evolved and evolved. And at some point, for my, my, my case, my father said when I was finishing engineering school, she, he, would, he said to me, all I want is for you to go be with your mother for six months because I see that her company is going to have a tremendous future. And dad was not a man we ever said no to because he was really the backbone of, of our family. So what started out as six months to, to help mother in this business, she had just been hired by Harry Helmsley to, to do the palace first big building. And um, so, it, you know, you said yes in a, in, in a family, which I'm sure is the case in a lot of your other families. You just say out of love and because that's what you do. And then it evolved in a great career with an amazing mentor because my mother, as well as my father, have been amazing mentors in a great teacher. I have never in my life met a better salesperson than my mother. And, and Alexandra, I have to give you uh, your time uh, as well. Tell us a little bit about, because you, you would represent now the third generation uh, in the family. And so, you know, how, what, from your perspective, how did that evolve and were you pushed or pulled in the pool or did you know where the pool was? Did you back into it by accident? Um, so I was a lord into the pool. When I was a kid, my grandmother would take me to architecture meetings with her after school and stuff, so I thought it was a fun activity. Needless did I say, she was training me for, for coming into the business. Uh, 
uh, often the family says that, you know, we're, we have free liberties to work wherever we want as long as we're working. But she trained me kind of like an outlier from that book that talks about, you know, the hockey players that train all yeah. and started to work in the family business in 2008. So I got hit by a tsunami and a hurricane and um, in the recession. So I figured if we survived through this family business, you know, I could come out knowing what I know now, I probably would have spent a couple of years out of the family business and then come and apply, you know, talking about, you know, family business planning and, and what to do. But I was definitely a Lord with a little hard hat coming in, spending time with my grandmother who knew that 14 years later, I'd, I'd be in the business. Uh, uh, you, you can't, you can't, uh, I mean, uh, well, I ask you, what are you going to say? You can, you can never say no to it. Well, it's, it's just an impossible. I mean, you can't see her blue eyes over here. You don't say no to her. It's no, very hard. Well, I, I think we're both in 1450 Brickle. So I might have to come by and, and seek some words of wisdom later on. Um, <laughs> but th thank you one very thing much. That happens, Go ahead. I'm one sorry. One thing that happens in generations is I think when you've been in a country for a while as we have, is that our third generation has a lot of background in actual real estate. Alexander went and got a master's degree at Columbia in, in real estate in development. Um, my sister Lisa and I were different. She has a psychology background. I have an engineering background. So, but I think this third generation has more backgrounds in actually our business. And they bring new things like family planning. I have a straight wife. Yes, you are very straight wise. <laughs> So uh, that, that's a great segue into uh, the Graham family. So we've gone from Jessica being the second generation and now um, the Cervera family in its third generation with Alexandra. Um, turn it over to uh, Stu and, and Philip uh, Wiley. You're in now your, your transition to the fourth generation, which now starts expanding a little bit into uh, uh, cousins and, and a, a little bit of an extended family, which we can touch on later on. But, you know, Stu, you, you, you married into the Graham family. You, you told me about your phenomenal relationship uh, with your father-in-law. But I, I wanted to hear from both you and Phil about um, how you ended up getting in the pool if you got pushed or, or pulled. And the unique perspective of, of marrying into the family as well, uh, I'm sure, is, is one that, that folks are interested in. Yeah, I, I think I would have to say I was somewhat pulled. Um, I had been in the business for 15 years. I was happy doing what I was doing and uh, was invited to lunch with my father-in-law, my brother-in-law. And, um, you know, next thing I know, they were suggesting that I come work here. And I remember telling my wife that the last thing I was ever going to do was go to work for my wife's family's business. <laughs> but that was over 30 years ago, and it turned out to be a great decision. Uh, you know, proud to be here, proud of what we do. And um, as you mentioned, we're actively trying to figure out how to move from the third generation to the fourth generation. Um, you know, we started in, <clears throat> it was 1932, so we're coming up on almost 90 years. Um, you know, we have our main business here in Miami Lakes, but we also have a lot of agricultural businesses outside of here and dairy and cattle and various other things. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's been a great experience. I'll let Philip tell you whether he thinks he was pushed or pulled, so. Yeah, I would say I, I probably more along the lines of jumped in. Um, I've been immersed in the, you know, the commercial real estate industry, having both my dad and, and mom work at the company. So every dinner and, you know, uh, it was some sort of business was, was talked about. So it was always around it, always was interested in it and really was pretty much new from the day I went to undergrad, kind of the path I wanted to take. And pretty much followed it. You know, obviously nothing ever goes exactly as planned, but um, I definitely would say that I, I jumped in willingly and enthusiastically. So but there wasn't a, a father-in-law involved, you know, yeah. sitting you at the mafia style table telling no. you this is how the world's going to work? Not at all. Not at okay. All. Stu, thank you very much for, for the, a lot of those stories that we had uh, on uh, background preparing for the panel. Um, and, and really the next question comes from, I, I want to stick with, with you both, um, because the, the next question really uh, developed organically about mentorship. Um, you know, the importance of mentorship, uh, I, all of you explained to me the, the important role that's taken, um, the Severa family, uh, Jessica with, with your father, Tony, 
Um, and, you know, since we're, we're talking now, Stu and Phil, I wanted to, you know, talk about mentorship and, and the role that that plays within the different generations, because it's, it's something that's unique to the, to the family business. Yes, in, in the business world, we have phenomenal mentors. I, I can tell you that um, Al Dodson here at my office, our managing partner, is I, I, I can't imagine a, a better mentor um, being, being able to work with him directly. Um, but again, the, the family aspect has to be something that's even greater than that from a mentorship standpoint, because you're just, it's 24 seven, you're living and breathing it. So it, it, I wanted to know if we can start off with, with, with uh, Stu and, and Phil's perspective on the importance of mentorship and the role that that's played. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot about culture. You know, it's the culture that the family has that, that, that moves into the business. Um, and as far as mentoring, you know, it's important, not just your, your children. We have a bunch of cousins here too. And in fact, one of Philip's cousins, I probably spend more time with him on a daily basis than I do with either Philip or, or my daughter, Laura, who's running all of our commercial property stuff. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we try, the third generation, I think, puts a lot of effort um, to try and instill the culture that was passed down from the generation before us. And we do that both by example and, and actually by being very formal about it. You know, we have a family council, we have a written family protocol, we have rules. Um, and, and these things kind of help define what we think is acceptable in a family business. And uh, it's, it's obviously very important. Yeah, I would say as, as far as mentorship goes, I mean, I think my mom who was running the commercial division when I first started at the company, and I do mainly the, the leasing and uh, kind of some of, get involved in some of the development stuff for our office and retail product at this point. But, you know, I mean, when someone, no one knows you better than your mom. Um, she knows my strengths, my weaknesses. So she, you know, has been a pretty effective mentor and I drive her nuts sometimes, you know, yes, I'm the guy does. that's calling <laughs> at 10 o'clock to talk about a deal, not talk about my, you know, little nephew Brooks, but, you know, so, and she's trying to retire. So, so I'm, I'm trying to hold her in, you know, and keep her involved. But, you know, I would say it's, you know, I've worked underneath her now for, I think, seven, eight years. So, you know, had a lot of time to kind of develop underneath her. And, you know, like I said, she knows where my strengths are and, she lets me kind of run with those and then she knows where, where my weaknesses are and tries to support, you know, where, where I need help. So I think it's been a good kind of good partnership. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica because that, that reminds me of the 10 o'clock, the comment I made about the 10 o'clock phone call, whether it's for the grandkids or to talk about a, a, a tenant and leasing, I have to credit Jessica for it. And it was I, actually 11 o'clock. I gave him till 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, <laughs> it was, and it was 11, but, um, but yeah, um, you know, thinking about mentorship, you know, it's really interesting. I was, you know, I had a great job at Saks Fifth Avenue. I was the associate fashion director for the company of Saks Fifth Avenue when I decided that, you know, coming from parents of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial parents that I was ready for my next journey and I wanted to go to graduate school um, and get an MBA. And my mom, you know, I love what Philip said that, you know, moms know you best. Um, you know, my mom said, you know, there's no better teacher than your father and you should take advantage um, and go to the Tony Goldman School of Business. And, you know, as a, as a young lady, you know, I had an incredible relationship with my dad and I was concerned that that would change if we worked together. So I was a little, you know, I had a little trepidation about doing that, but I gave him a one-year contract and I said, put me through all the different parts of our business. Let me see if I can contribute um, and then, you know, and then we'll have a conversation in a year from now. And as Did everybody freeze or just Jessica? I think just Pardon. Jessica. Jessica, sorry. you're back. You're back. Don't worry, you're back. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a hotel, so my internet connection is not the best. It's not a problem. It was a very flattering pose. Okay, as good. Far as, as far as Zoom calls go, there was a very flattering pose that you got frozen. And so please. Okay. Continue. Well, I hope I, don't, I hope I don't freeze again. But I was just saying, you know, mentorship is incredibly important in many ways. And my dad was probably the greatest mentor I could ever have. Um, and, you know, we shared a partner's desk for 15 years. I chose to be a sponge. I chose to learn everything I could possibly learn, be the first one in, the last one out, you know, every day. 
work hard, work with a smile on your face, do it, whatever is asked of you, obviously that is appropriate, um, you know, and, you know, and, and really try to contribute. You know, it is, I've learned many lessons. I've learned that it's very important in the family business to be known for your first name and not your last name. Um, I think it's very important for young people to go outside of the family business first um, before they join the family business. Um, and, you know, and when my dad, my dad passed away nine years, almost nine years ago, and I was 40 years old at the time. And, um, you know, and he was a very young man and, and I, you know, at least young for me. Um, and it's devastating to lose your father. And it's also devastating to lose the founder of your company. And, you know, and I felt very much like I had been the co-pilot of a jumbo jet, um, you know, kind of for those 15 years. And, you know, and then all of a sudden he's not there anymore and I've got the jumbo jet wheel to myself and kind of learning how to maneuver that in my own way with my own skills and my own talents. Um, but, you know, I, I think the thing about legacy is that the voice, the, the mentor, the voice of the mentor goes from being external to goes to being internal and it's a very, very powerful experience because the, le the, the years and years and years of sitting around the dining table, the years of, yes, those 11 o'clock or 1045 calls about business, um, you know, all of those stay with you forever. And, you know, and legacy, your family business is, it's really, it's very much a part of your DNA. It's very much a part of who you are. It's your children, you know, it's your children learn about business, you're, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And when you lose that mentor, it's important to find other sources of learning and other sources of support. Um, be it in, you know, in school, I still go to school, I do a program at the Harvard Business School, a leadership program, I've been doing it for 10 years, um, you know, and to find other sources of strength. Um, because we all need to be students and we all need to be teachers and you can be the same at any age. So uh, I just want to ask you a quick question. You mentioned that you had to draw up, a, you drew up a one year business contract mm -hmm. with your dad. How it's heavily redlined and negotiated was that document or he just took it and he signed it right away? It was a handshake deal. It was a handshake, old, old school handshake. Old school, old school, Tony Goldman style, old school you handshake. Bet. Deal. Old school handshake. Fantastic. Um, of course, I want to let the Cervera family um, weigh in on the importance and role of mentorship. I think that we, you know, mixed into that uh, is the role of culture and that the, 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 the older generation embarks, in, imposes on, in, in, instills, excuse me, on, the younger generation. So I wanted to allow you to comment on, on the mentorship role and anybody can, can take this, whether it's uh, the queen uh, or uh, one of her loyal subjects. I will delegate that the queen to my daughter and my granddaughter to speak our mentor. But I think that they're going to talk about my mother that was born in 1906 wow. <laughs> and she was a great, Veronica, why you think? Well, uh, you know, my, my mother East came from Peru to Cuba because her father was sent as ambassador there. And then, you know, uh, the, the Cuban history brought us to Miami. But my Peruvian grandmother actually built homes, luxury homes in Peru in a time where um, she told me when there was no cement, I'd tell my driver, follow that cement truck because after they deliver their big order, there's going to be some cement left and I'm going to use it for my houses. So grandmother built about 50 luxury homes. The first dog, um, 21. 21, okay. So, be, but I'm putting all together the palace court, the building that she built in is still iconic in the city, which had like 20 units. So when all of this happened and we found ourselves in the United States, it was grandmother who kind of came and mentored and mentored and mentored. And uh, so it, it comes from the grandmother in the ability of um, always providing a need, a niche, see what the market needs and provide that need. Um, and then and then followed through by my mother, who she only accepts the best work. So if you are 
uh, if you work for the company, you're expected to deliver the best. If you are related to my mother, you are going to get that 11 o'clock or five minutes to 11 o'clock call to make sure everybody's right in the household and there will always be something about business and she takes nothing but 100, 100% of, of the best. She expects you to, you know, to know exactly what's happening in the community, what's happening in your household, et cetera, et cetera, mom. So I always tell anyone when I walk into that office, if you think I'm demanding, I'll send my mother over to spend the day here. That, that's, um, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Uh, Alexander, did you want to uh, weigh in on uh, being the one that's the, the beneficiary of multiple, gener the most generations of uh, mentorship and culture at this point in time? Yeah, and the 11% success chance of the third generation succeeding in the family business, right. just in case any when that came to mind, I, I'm lucky to have two mentors, obviously, and also my aunt, and I have each one fills a different need, which is great. When I need the big brainstorming kind of what should I do as the next transition in the family, how can I participate in creating a new growth, I talk to the visionary. When I need negotiating skills and my one of my Mexican clients is being super difficult, I call her. <laughs> and, and then my aunt, when I need the public speaking guides and different things and stats, I text her this morning. I was like, any remarks on how, what we should say, what should we communicate? So I find it to be a very good balance. But also in a family business, it's important to have a mentor that is not in the, the company. And I have a mentor who, for example, I got offered a job in New York that was very significant. I was living in New York getting my master's degree debating about whether coming back to the family immediately. And I called him because obviously if I called my grandmother, it's no, when are you moving back home? So it's important to have someone outside of the family perspective to guide you, to help, to see where the company should grow, what you should do and help. So that's kind of my advice to people as well. That's, that's a, a great tip, not just in the family, but outside. Uh, the family as well. Uh, there was a there was a comment uh, that uh, Veronica made about the family is the one that expects the best from you. That is an incredibly important component of, of the family legacy. And I saw in my Holly, Hollywood Squares board, I saw Jessica's head go like this. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So Jessica, I have to, I have to follow up with you on that thought on the importance of the expectations that the family has uh, versus not, you know, being in a different environment and, and, and the heightened expectations, I would imagine. Is. Oh, expectations are huge. I mean, you have to work harder than anybody else. You, I mean, at least in my family, um, you know, and so it's, but, but I also, you know, I come from parents that the first and foremost expectation was of themselves. Right, so that's, I feel the same way. You know, if you work for me, my expectations of you are very high, but first and foremost, the expectations of myself are even higher, um, you know? And so I think that work ethic is, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have a really solid work ethic, you can be successful in anything. Um, you don't have to be the smartest kid on the block. You have to work hard. And so I think that I, I've learned, I've learned that I've learned, you know, that, you know, um, listening this morning and, and listening to, uh, you know, about purpose and, and kind of the, the importance of, of business and what businesses stand for and what family businesses stand for, you know, for me, it was always about infuse your DNA into your organization, make it you, you know, make it, um, make it individual, you know, lead by example for me was always the, one of the most important things that, that I learned and that I try to model, um, you know, as a leader, you know, being passionate, infusing creativity into everything that we do, um, you know, trying to in, improve on the, the quality of life for other people, you know, that's purpose. Family business is about purpose. You know, yes, sure, we're not in this as a, as a, um, you know, as a hobby um, and business has to sustain itself and make money. And, 
you know, I look at that as that that en enables us to hire more people and impact more people. And what a beautiful thing that is, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's it's um, purpose drives everything right. You know, why do you want to wake up in the morning? Why do you want to do what you want to do? And I think it's important to share those things with your company, the people within your company and uh, share those things with your family. I mean, I loved hearing about all the incredible things about Miami this morning, but let's be very, let's be very real and very honest. You know, we've had a horrible year. Everybody on the planet has had a earth shattering, devastating year. And so we are the beneficiaries. I mean, thank goodness we're the beneficiaries of an extraordinary kind of comeback and opportunity and let's not take that for granted for a second. Um, let's recognize that we have to work for it and earn it. Um, and that it is our responsibility to improve the lives of as many people as we can in as many places as we can. That's a family business. That is purpose. Um, you know, and and I and I do I believe that with response, you know, with a platform comes responsibility. And so Every member of a family, no matter what your last name is, you know, is uh, has a responsibility as a family member to their community. So, you know, for me, it's a privilege, always has been, to work in a family business. It's not easy, you know, it's challenging, it's difficult, but it's also a blessing and a privilege. Um, so... Well, uh, I, I just want to stop a moment and, 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 and pick on one, one of your remarks about, um, you know, I think we, at, at the end of this year, you know, hopefully this is the end where we're on the other side of this thing over the last year. And as, as we take moments, you know, we take time, different, different, we'll all reflect in a different way on, on, on what's occurred over the last year. But, you know, without taking away from um, the different ways people have been impacted negatively, this is definitely Miami's uh, moment where we have absolutely become exactly. the beneficiaries of this for a number of uh, different reasons. But we absolutely, I, I agree with the sentiment 100% that we have to take advantage of this moment right now and continue and keep those tailwinds uh, behind us and push forward. But in doing so, not forget that you know we're in an environment where not everybody um, has benefited in, in the same way. Well, you know, I feel like I learned 10 years worth of lessons in one year yeah. in, in 2020. And I, I, you know, I look at 2020 as the year of reflection and I look at 2021 as the year of the decision. And I think people are making really kind of um, once, not once in a lifetime, but like really important decisions, whether it's, do they wanna move? What do they want their quality of life to be? What do they want to be doing? Who do they want to be doing it with? What kinds of projects do they want to be working on? I mean, we're seeing real shifts of courage after going through a year of struggle, um, you know, and I think that that's a really exciting thing for sure. Um, you know, and if you, if you lose sight of that year of reflection, um, you know, then it's a waste, um, you know, and really kind of take advantage of the fact that Struggle is a good thing. Struggle is an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to grow. And so, you know, I, I, I really, I feel like, I mean, in the real estate business and yeah, we're doing incredible right now. Um, but last year, never in, a, in, a, in my entire career would I ever imagine that every single one of our tenants would either stop paying rent or be unable to pay rent, right. like hundreds of tenants, that's un unheard of. Um, and so you do what you can, you help how you can. Um, but I think it's, I think that it was a moment to, to kind of reset everything and reimagine what do you want your business to look like for the next decade or two or three? Where, where were the pain points and how can you readjust for the pain points and be better? And so I think that I think that everyone everywhere should really have the opportunity to um, to make courageous decisions in 2021. Um, and I think that Miami is, you know, 
for those of us that have lived here for a long time, we have understood and appreciate how special it is. Um, and now I think a lot of other people are kind of tuning in to the fact that this really is the city of the future. This will be one of the most important cities in the world. And I, I mean, I have to, I have to pick up on that with, with the other uh, panelists. This is kind of, this is where you, you kind of go off on a tangent a little bit, but I, I think that you just hit the nail on the head about kind of when this thing started, we were staring at the abyss and we didn't know what was staring back at us, what it was going to look like. And I have to imagine that for, for legacy families, if I could um, call on the Cervera family for a second, you know, as, as a legacy family in, in so many generations, and, and I want to let Phil and, and Stu weigh in on this also, but when, when this started, you know, for example, at Cerveras, you guys are heavily vested in luxury real estate, and this thing is going on. And it's not just, oh, I'm, you know, I'm an employee, I'm going to go pack up and something will happen and you know, we'll figure it out. I mean, this is the legacy. This is the family. This is, you know, in, ingrained into your DNA, as, as, as Jessica said. You can't change. And you, you have to be all in and committed to this. You know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, that, that onset in the abyss and, and where you see the future right now. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to give you any PTSD because I mean, thinking about it, if you reflection is good, but I don't want to have anybody uh, hyperventilate because we were in a very precarious position. Um, but look, you know, for perspective, uh, Severa Real Estate's listed six billion dollars of pre-construction inventory in the last five years. Eighty percent of it released uh, inventory has been sold. You know, that's the story of, of right now. It's hot and it's moving, and, it, and it, there's not enough inventory there, as we saw. But before that, you know, there had to be some moment of pause and reflection on the legacy, I would imagine. Well, you know, Miami is an ever-changing city because if it's true that, that today a lot of the market is coming from the United States, from within our own country, uh, if you take out the, the Latin American factor in Miami, you're going to be at a loss because we're, the, the newspapers are all talking about the, uh, the client from within the United States and they stop talking about the client from Latin America. Mm -hmm. But if, if you look at, at the numbers in the city, the Mexicans make a tremendous percentage of our buyers. They just don't make the newspapers. And if, we look at, if we're looking today at the elections in South America, there's going to be a critical election that's going to be determined in the next few days because the, the Peruvians had an election yesterday. And why is Peru so important to us? Well, among other things, Peru is the second producer of copper in the, in the world. And it is uh, strategic that, that Peru not become uh, leftist tendencies, that Peru remain a, uh, a place where um, business can thrive and a democracy can thrive. So Miami has always had different ways and where it's important that, that we pay attention to all, all of these waves. We also have to pay attention to the infrastructure of our city and how it's constantly evolving and how it can handle all of the people that are coming in. You know, I just returned from New York. I was in New York for a couple of days and I've always loved New York, but I felt sorry for New York. I mean, I was quite, I didn't expect it to be great, but I didn't expect it to be in the condition that I found it the last few days that I was there. I, I came back to Miami, and this morning as I was driving to the office, I said, my God, how fortunate to be able to live in this wonderful city where we can uh, do so many things. And we take it for granted that our city is such a clean city. The air is so great. Um, it just runs. And I, you know, I thank our, our, our mayor and our, and our government for having a city because business, if it's not supported through our government, just doesn't work. But I see Miami in a very positive light. I see Miami as having uh, attracted always the top talent from everywhere in the world. We have been leaders in style and in architecture for a long, long time. So, um, you know, I tell everybody, when you come to Florida, please leave the ideas that made your state very unpopular and unhealthy <laughs> for business. Put them in your state and come look at what's made Florida a great place to live and a great place to thrive. I think people have also come to realize the value on a per dollar square foot, as everyone likes to talk about how Miami is now more urban, as well as 
suburban combination and the affordability for the for most people and often they talk about one of the things having lived in New York for a couple of years is that it's not affordable to live and to work in Manhattan as it is in Miami because we're also a driving community. So when you think Miami is still relatively affordable compared to any other CBD in, in the country, comparing to Chicago, LA, as well as New York and Boston. And that's something that I believe in efforts with our, our mayor that we're working to continue to keep affordability within the city for as well as the employees and not only the billionaires to come here. And we have to maintain that balance and work very collectively. And I think as brokers in this community, we try to influence our clients to keep that balance. Well, it, it's, it's definitely uh, enlightening uh, the commentary about the international buyer because it seems like the focus is about the domestic buyer. It's almost like domestic, it's a mix between uh, value proposition as, as you said, Alexandra, and it's become almost like domestic flight capital to Miami and we're used to only the international. So let's see, hopefully, you know, as, as COVID continues and bettering in other countries, it'll continue to open the markets uh, in Latin America and we'll see that Latin American buyer come back even stronger. I just don't know if we're going to have the inventory for it. You're going to have to let us know where the, where the next buildings are, are, are going to be, right? Um, Stu uh, and, and Phil, you, you, you know, looking out multiple generations after this, um, you know, what has this been an opportunity for you this, this past year for the family and the legacy? Obviously, you guys have, I mean, I don't even know how much land you have, uh, but I'd have to imagine that you're right up there with uh, FPNL and the Catholic Church uh, in terms of uh, land holdings. So uh, you have to have a very uh, long view uh, on, on, on your investment strategy. But if, if you can give us um, some insight on, on uh, you know, how you weathered this and the unique nature of the legacy and then where you see um, the horizon in the future. You're right. We're, we don't sell. We never have. So we, we do have a lot of land. We have um, a fairly significant piece outside of Miami Lakes that's entitled that we uh, that we will be, I think that'll be more the next generation. But I was really interested to, to hear what Jessica was saying about last year. I think it was very insightful and it, it got me thinking you know, how it impacted us, you know, my daughter who was gradually moving into the job that my wife had had for 45 years, all of a sudden overnight had 400 tenants on top of her and she had to deal with them and doing it remotely with all of her people out of the office. I mean, honest, thank God, I don't think my wife and I could have done it the way as well as she did it. She had the skill set, you know, she's a bright young lady. She, she was just all the, her technical abilities to, to do what she did. But um, I think Jessica said it, it was, it was a 10 year education. I mean, she came up to speed in a hurry. Uh, it wasn't pretty and it wasn't fun, but um, I think she's, she's the better off for it. And, you know, it's, it's pleasing. I think we had 400 tenants. I think we entered into 80 some odd, you know, uh, deferral or whatever agreements with those tenants. And of those tenants now, they're probably 80, 85% current. So we're all working through this together. You know, we worked really hard to strike a balance between, you know, I mean, we have lenders, we have people we have to report to, but trying to, um, on an individual basis, work with our tenants and be reasonable and come up with plans that work for everybody. And, and I'm, I'm just really proud of the job they did. I, they, we just navigated a, a really, really, really tough, tough time. And, and, you know, when you have to circle the wagons and things are getting tough, there's nothing like having family members around you, you know, so. And, and, and Phil, would you uh, t tell us about your experience in the last year? Was it a 10 year acceleration for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we all dealt with it. You know, I mean, my sister and I kind of tag team the commercial uh, part of the business. So she does a lot of, you know, kind of the more, asset manager role and I'm on the leasing and marketing side and but we both got heavily involved in these agreements with tenants and you know they're calling me they're calling her but I think one of the biggest things I learned from this whole thing and, and my mom preaches it all the time is the value of diversity I mean we have office industrial retail apartments farms and hotels so when the hotels were 
absolutely dead and we were just getting crushed there, our industrial was at all time highs in occupancy. So, you know, having that, that diversity really helped us get through this storm. And I think long-term is kind of a key to us, although it can be difficult managing all those different asset types, but you know, it's a, it definitely helps when you, when you have the diversity so that when some parts of your portfolio are weak, the other ones help make up for it. And, you know, we, like my dad said, we, we entered into a lot of agreement agreements and I'm surprised and happy to see how well the tenants have bounced back. I mean, some of our tenants are doing better now than they ever were, you know, they got more outdoor seating and they can, you know, serve more people. And there, there's a lot of that, but I think, you know, uh, that's, that's definitely one of the big takeaways for me is, is, value of having all these different assets. Yeah, I would say one of the one of the few silver linings is that, you know, the, the government approval process is never easy for, for anybody. It doesn't matter what your last name is or or what municipality they're in. There are 35 municipalities or jurisdictions in the Miami-Dade County. And uh, I guess one of the silver linings was, you know, seeing more flexibility baked in and their willingness to do things to help FMB and hospitality and, and, and allow outdoor seating, which never made sense to me. Why don't you allow, you know, we, we live in a, in a world where we have this incredible commodity that nobody else can buy, which is our weather. For, for the love of God, let us have more outdoor seating and forever and a day, they never let us do that. And now finally, it seems like it's here to stay. And that's just one of the examples of how, you know, we're, we're, we're in the future gonna be impacted uh, by COVID and many little um, small wrinkles um, going forward on, on, on the next projects. Um, uh, Jessica, uh, I wanted to go back to you a second because I had a note here from our conversation we prepared for the panel. And you made a comment about um, how difficult uh, COVID was from the standpoint of just not being an employer, but it being the family and almost like an extended family with a lot of the people that have been with you for a very long time and some difficult choices that you had to make um, going through that. And obviously we learned a great deal and, you know, the, uh, the next chapter is still to be written, but the chapter we're in right now is very positive, but I, I can imagine that was, uh, uniquely challenging being part of a, of a family business. Yeah. You know, something that Stu said kind of resonated with me about his daughter and, you know, in times of crisis, you really see what people are made of. Um, and how family is so critical. I mean, my husband who is, you know, I'm happily married for 20 years and he's one of the most brilliant human beings I know. We would not have gotten through this without him. You know, he jumped in and, you know, and literally it was like an all hands on deck kind of, a, of an experience. And I think, you know, to what you're saying and what we spoke of a little earlier, you know, there was this balance between empathy and survival. Right. That's how I looked at it. You know, it was empathy and survival. And we had a lot of staff members that have been with us for a really long time. And they do become family members. They know your children. They've watched your children grow. You know their children. You know, you've gone through the goods and the bads together. And so, you know, but at the same time, you have to survive to live another day. And so, you know, as a family business, we've always gone about on the premise of a marathon mindset. We are not sprinters, we are marathoners. We have patience. We are, you know, we're, we're thinking about 50 years, you know, in advance and 100 years and generations. And so it was, it was a really, really painful thing because, you know, there were people we had to let go. Um, and, I cried at the dinner table. My kids saw, you know, they saw the struggles, they saw the weeping, and I hope they never, ever forget it. I hope I never have to do anything like that again. Um, you know, and that was probably one of the worst experiences of my, you know, really of my life, forget about professional career. Um, but, you know, it's also, um, you know, if you recognize also that, you know, that there, there will be light um, you know, there will be a new day. And I think that we're seeing that we're seeing that with, you know, with the increase in business with the increase in employment. Now it's hard to get employees. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that's a struggle. And you know, that's, that's a, you know, call it a benefit, call it a struggle. I mean, you know, these are all, we're, we're all having to learn how to be very, very fluid. 
Um, and so survival and empathy, you know, as family businesses, we have very big hearts, um, which is a really beautiful thing. Um, and so, and that's what people want to be a part of. They want to be some, you know, part of something that they know the, the, um, what's the word, the, um, um, I'm forgetting the word. They want to know what, what the family stands for. And in times of challenge, what will they stand for? And so, you know, my hope is that the Goldman family, the Srebnik family, you know, has deep integrity and a deep work ethic. And uh, we will always do whatever we can to do the right thing. But yeah, it was an experience that I'm, I'm all the wiser. And I hope I don't have to go through that one again. I, I think that everybody on this uh, board will, I mean, on this panel will uh, echo that sentiment that uh, hopefully, you know, we, we've been through a lot in, in the real estate industry, especially here in South Florida. Uh, you know, I think Alex mentioned that she came out of uh, a school in, in, in 2008. Uh, I'll check my diploma, but I think I graduated law school in, in 2004. So I didn't, I didn't get that much of a runway either before we ran smack into uh, that in, uh, great recession. And then just when you think there's nothing that can ever um, get to that level of, of DEF CON red alert, uh, all of a sudden, you know, we, we run into uh, COVID. Um, but can again- I make, Can I yeah, make uh, one comment though? Because I learned something that really changed my entire mindset from 2020 to 2021. And it's to lean- I have my pen. I'm taking a note to this one. Lean into discomfort, lean into it. Don't be afraid of it, lean into it. That's, you know, like find the courage to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. And when I did that, I wasn't afraid of like the challenge or I wasn't afraid of, you know, look, I went on a big roller coaster the other day. I've never done that before. <laughs> it was terrifying, but it was like also freeing. So I, I'm just saying lean into dis the discomfort and don't be afraid of it. That's when the greatest change happens. That, I mean, I, I'm going to run out of ink pretty soon on all the phenomenal uh, advice that I'm getting here. I feel like this panel has been, uh, you know, uh, an educational experience and all the wisdom from uh, all three of your families uh, and companies. And, and as we wind it down, we have uh, five minutes left. I wanted to just, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, close the panel without asking for some little anecdotes, if I could, from within the family dynamic. Um, you know, if you have a good story, uh, you know, where it's uniquely, uh, it's, it's unique to the family business because, you know, there is an incredible blurring of the lines between the boardroom and, uh, and the boardroom table and the dining room table. Um, so I'm sure there's something that really sticks in your mind. And since I have the all, all three uh, Severa ladies in, in, in all three generations, they can combine quickly to give me uh, uh, at least one good one uh, to start with. Well, my father's favorite comment was that he said to my mother, he used to tease her, he says, you're like the Pope, you're never wrong. And if you are, none of us are certainly going to tell you. <laughs> so and that's kind of the family mento in my, in my family. <laughs> so, and we are, you know, it's, it's like um, family can be lots of fun. We talk about things when, when they're difficult, but I've heard it from all of you. Family is tremendous fun. And um, it, it, the, my parents always had a, a, a situation where it's, great to disagree, but it's greater to be a family. So that, that has always kept all of our legacies. And I, for instance, enjoy a lot my niece. I think she's, she's a hard worker. She has tremendous ideas. She just, she and her husband just made me godmother to their child, which I thought was wonderful. So we can, we can laugh about our mistakes. We're always there for each other and it's okay to disagree. And when, and when we can't uh, disagree, then we can't have conversations. And uh, the, the new generation, I'm sure, has plenty of stories of, about us. Um, well, yeah, I, I have a funny story we can tell about mom when we're training, like, a new sales team for a project. She goes, you have to dress the part. If you're selling a $5 million apartment, you need to look like $5 million. 
and I was starting just very, very in the beginning before officially, like in 2008, like in 2007, I got my real estate license. I was doing certain things. We were still faxing contracts, just to put it oh, no. back there. So I came in for a minute. I was still in college. I'll never forget. In a yellow t-shirt and white shorts, going to the beach, I came into the office for a minute to fax a contract so no one could see me. My mom looks at me. She's like, well, I don't know what you're wearing, but we have a uh, meeting with a bunch of Italians right now. You need to come into the meeting. <laughs> I was mortified. <laughs> the most handsome, like, Italians, very well-dressed, like, impeccable, and I'm in shorts and a white T-shirt and a yellow T-shirt. <laughs> I will, you know, those things kind of, in a family business, she's like, you're going to figure this out later and this is never going to be repeated. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> got it. Very clear. So, you know. That's a funny kind of incident in the in the office. We always, despite when we disagree on things, we work very hard to get back into the middle of it. And I think having five of us brings a healthy balance to supporting to bring us always back together. And as my grandfather said, it was my divine right to keep everyone, you know, on the same platform. Those are fantastic, fantastic stories. Uh, but did you were you able to close the deal in the in the t-shirt and and, uh, and and sneakers or? Uh, yeah, and on top of that, I tripped over the filing cabinet while I was walking over, so I was bleeding. Well, and the guy in the glass table goes, "By the way, you're bleeding." I was like, "Great." I, was like, I mean, that, sure. that sounds like great uh, Hollywood material. You might have to sell that story. Uh, yeah. So that's always how I tell my staff. I'm like, always dress for the part just because I've had that experience myself and I think it makes it more relatable for our staff to understand why and how. Yeah. I have a funny story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Veronica has a good memory for movie people, people that work in the movies or things like that. And once we were in a, in a project and, and we need a plumber, so we call a plumber. So all of a sudden somebody in jeans and, and shirt comes walks into the office. I immediately recognize him as being the number one uh, artist, actor, actor. actor uh, in Mexico. Very famous, very handsome. Every woman loved him. And Veronica went to him directly and said, oh, Joyce, this number, come here because we have an emergency. <laughs> you could never, I could never forget the face of that man. <laughs> of course, he didn't bother the price. <laughs> But I got the plumbing issue to take it care of. The, yeah, I was going to ask. I wanted to make sure you got the plumbing issue taken care of. Uh, uh, she hasn't forgotten. Uh, I mean, he walked in at the right time. I thought he was a plumber. I needed help, and off we went. Oh, it's important it, to, to be up to date in everything. No? Who is the best <laughs> tennis player? Who is the best golf player? It's very important to have knowledge in our profession. <laughs> well, it's, it's, those are phenomenal stories. And, and again, uh, thank you very much for, for all the insight and participation and words of wisdom. I wanted to go uh, to Stu and Phil to give me a good anecdote of what it's like to work within uh, a legacy family in the real estate world. And then uh, last but not least, we'll, we'll go to Jessica. Sure. <clears throat> well, as the developers of Miami Lakes, you know, we lived in Miami Lakes, Philip and his sister Laura were raised here. And one day he was a little guy, I was driving him home from school and he said, dad, he said, do you and mom have a million dollars in the bank? So that's kind of odd. And he said, no, son, we don't have a million dollars in the bank. He thought about that and he said, yeah, I guess that's right. He said, because if you had a million dollars in the bank, we'd live in Weston. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to give you an idea of kind of the, try to keep them below the radar, but that was it. But I, I would I would tend to disagree with that comment. I mean, yeah. Weston, that's that's north of that county line and north of Miami Dade, we all know is-, is Well, county. he went to school at American Heritage, so all of his buddies lived in, in uh, Weston, I guess it was. That's well, I, I, I'm sure that he got the last laugh being part of the family and uh, and That's all right. the great things you guys have done here uh, in, in Miami Lakes and the greater, greater Miami uh, area as well. So thank you very much uh, for, for joining the panel. And then last but not least, Jessica. Um, you know, I, at some point, I would love to write a book called Lessons from a Father to a Daughter. And I hope, I hope I get the opportunity to write that book. Um, I've learned a lot from being a part of a family business. I've learned that it's really important 
to live a life or I wish to live a life that my family would be proud of. And I think if, if you know, if family members kind of take that to heart that um, have a lot of great family members and a lot of great family businesses. So I, I do try to live a life that my family would be proud of, that my dad would be proud of and my mom. Um, you know, there are a lot of lessons, you know, in, very important to be respectful of each other in a family, to be patient with each other, to be loving, and to also to be yourself, because I'm not my dad. I'm not my mom. I'm not my brother. I'm very different. I have different points of view. I have different, you know, we're all different. And I think it's really important to embrace the differences. That's not always easy to do. Um, you know, and I, I've learned a lot of things about, you know, be be known for your, like I said, be known for your first name and not your last name, but also be known for your intelligence and your work ethic. Um, you know, that, that's always something that's been very important to my family. Um, and my mom taught me something at the age of 13 years old, and I'll never forget it. She said, if you can stand up to your father, you can stand up to anyone. And it's, it's, it's been very, very good advice. And I did stand up to my father when I was 13 years old. And, you know, and he, we used to call him the tornado because oh. he would kind of come into the office and he'd whip everything up and then he'd leave. Um, and then we'd have to pick up everything afterwards. Um, but yeah, you know, when you come from a very, very force of nature kind of founder, force of nature father, um, you know, it's important to find your own strength to be able to stand up to that. And if you can do that, which I did, um, I, you know, I have no issue standing up to anybody. So it's, a, and, I, and doing so with grace and kindness, you know, leading with the hand and not the hammer. So yeah, that's family business has been an amazing journey. Well, tomorrow's my uh, daughter's birthday. She turns eight. So that gives me uh, a couple of years still before um, we have that face off. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I really- call me. I'll give her some tips. I, don't know. I, I think she's doing fine on her own, but uh, listen, I, I think that this panel discussion has been phenomenally enlightening for, for myself and I hope for everybody else that had the opportunity to participate. Uh, you know, it's just a unique situation to be able to speak to, 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 to families that have made this city talk a little bit about our real estate but more so about what makes uh the family special and the, the different lessons that you've learned and and to do that each of you has had to really open up um uh, uh you know and let us see a little bit behind the curtain so i want to i want to thank you all uh very much uh personally and on behalf um of the chamber for allowing us to do that um, I think there's a short Q&A session that I wanted to turn it over to Stephania uh, after that. So uh, if there were any questions or comments, uh, you can shoot them over. And uh, if not, then I want to turn it over to um, Stephania, who will be providing uh, closing uh, remarks. I'm not seeing any questions right now. So um, I just want to, again, one final time, thank you all for participating. Uh, I think, I mean, I can easily tell you this has been the, the, the funnest and most enlightening panel that I've been on because normally we're talking about dry real estate stuff. And, uh, and I think that we, we hit what we needed to hit to talk about COVID and the opportunities and really having the, the foresight of a 50 year plan um, and the, mar the concept of the marathon. And uh, Miami will be, is in a best and a great phenomenal place today. I can't imagine another place we would all want to be, uh, given the current circumstance. And um, I think that'll be the case uh, for a long time going in the future. So thank you again uh, for your time. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Stephanie and somebody with much more technological prowess than me will somehow magically handle this. Oh, sorry, it looks like I was muted.
Thank you, everyone. I wanted to give, take this time to thank um, Anthony, our great moderator. You did an amazing job. And our panelists, um, the Goldman family, the Grant family, and Severa family for an excellent panel discussion. And a special thank to our sponsors, Douglas Elliman, Costa Construction, BDO, the Grants Company, and the Miami Association of Realtors. We appreciate, we appreciate all of you for joining in today's program, and please have a great day.